Many people in Africa may not be aware of the concept of artificial intelligence or simply AI. Yet, AI, according to Brookings Institute, is already transforming every aspect of our lives. So rapid and fundamental are the changes that the involvement of AI in our day-to-day -day activities, some known and others unknown to us, is beginning to raise pertinent questions for society. So this week on the program, we look at the benefits of AI for Africa, but also examine its likely long-term negative impact on livelihoods through loss of jobs and why it's critical to regulate the use of this technology. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, let's kick off our discussion and bring in our panel from Tokyo, Mark Einstein, Chief Analyst, Telecommunications and Digital Services. Joining us from London, Bayo Olubayo Adekanbi, Founder and Lead Consultant, Data Science Nigeria. And in Newbury, Peter Richardson, Partner and Research Director at CounterPoint Research. Gentlemen, a warm welcome to you all. Peter, let me start off with you. AI holds enormous potential to improve and transform many industries and create new opportunities. Why do you think AI is so beneficial? What are the most promising applications in AI today? Well, there are uh, almost an infinite variety of, of potential applications. Um, you know, some of them very kind of simple, some of them much more complex. So. You know, a simple thing may be using your smartphone camera to take better pictures uh, or a more complex application might be, you know, using AI to make new drug discoveries, that sort of thing. Dr. Bayo, do you agree? Do you feel that AI is beneficial? Indeed, AI is beneficial. Uh, we see it as an exponential technology uh, which has capacity to improve quality of life and, of course, enhance productivity. Uh, by making simple, you know, complex things simpler and of course helping to automate how we live, work and play in a way that is relatable and that is meaningful such that it creates economic multiplier effect. So I, I subscribe to that general opinion that indeed AI is extremely beneficial to improving quality of lives. Mark, let me get your view here because Elon Musk has described AI as a dangerous technology and it needs regulating to ensure it is operating within the public interest. He says that if unchecked, AI could pose a threat to society. Now, our panelists here are talking about how beneficial um, AI is. What are your thoughts? Is it a dangerous technology? Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's dangerous, but I certainly do have concerns. And I think that we are going to see really, really amazing applications, as the other panelists have said. But I think we're going to see some pretty nefarious applications as well. And I think the one that scares me the most is deepfakes. Uh, in only a few years, we're going to be able to make video and audio of anybody doing or saying anything that will be indistinguishable from real content. So the amount of fake news and fraud that is also going to come with AI is going to be massive, and we need a plan for this. Um, Dr. Bay, I want to uh, explore this a little bit because, you know, we have now an increased digitization of, you know, consumer applications, and we have seen major developments in technology and the usage of AI in, in these past years, uh, what Mark has talked about. Are AI systems, though, designed with privacy in mind? How do you protect sensitive data from being compromised or misused? Uh, indeed, uh, that fear is well situated, and of course the concern is true. Uh, there are two fundamental issues about AI applications. Uh, it's about control and alignment. Control means that when we are building AI system, we must be very intentional that we understand the input, the process, and the output to the extent that human dominance is not lost to machine. Control is critical. We must be in control. Because the risk of security, weaponization of AI, like my, uh, my co-panelist uh, you know, uh, mentioned, the whole issue about defake and so many other things around even privacy, uh, bias, and discriminations can come in. And the other one is alignment. When we are using AI, AI must be defaulted to be human-centric to the extent that it serves our desired goals and objectives. We do not leave AI to, to evolve on its own. And that speaks to the first point that was made around the fact that it is AI dangerous. Indeed, it is dangerous. 
but we must understand the fact that our evolution as human has been based on a cautious balance between risk and reward. So which means look at aviation, look at vaccination. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, people raised concerns. There were obvious risks. But because we saw the benefit, we saw the reward, so there was an intention to balance the two. And that, for me, is where uh, the, the old ethical consideration comes in, where we see AI not just as a box, but something that we can break to the extent that it serves our interests. We are not, uh, we're, we're not a slave to AI. AI is actually answering our issues in a way that is uh, aligned to our interests as people and things that we're in control of. Uh, Mark, let me get that uh, point from you, though, because Dr. Bayer has raised an interesting concern uh, regarding uh, the whole aspect of humans losing control of machines. What's your thought on that? Well, I would agree that there needs to be a more human, there always needs to be a human-centric approach to AI. Uh, I think one of the ways that we can deal with this is I would like to see a lot of these AI algorithms increasingly be open. And I would like to see a lot more auditing by third parties. And I, would, I think the public generally has a right to know um, what kind of data is going into AI, mm -hmm. you know, what is the algorithm program to do. Uh, and I think if we approach the market that way, I think it would certainly help to alleviate a lot of the concerns that uh, we've been talking about. So, Mark, let's take a step back first and, and figure out where we are uh, with the applications. Where are we today? I think it's a big debate as to whether or not we have real AI or we have advanced machine learning, and, and that's, that's a, a huge question in itself. But I think we are you know, at the point where a lot is being automated. I think that you know, chat GPT is what the whole world is talking about uh, today, but I think in the very near future, um, you're going to be able to talk to your smartphone or your PC and generate any kind of video, any kind of audio, any kind of image that you want. And I think this is really going to change the world in, in many, many ways. All right, uh, Dr. Bio, let me get your view. Do we have real AI here or just advanced machine learning? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, we see AI in three layers. There's what we call narrow AI. Uh, there's something we call uh, uh, strong AI, and then there is the super AI. Uh, today we're still in what we call weak AI, which is likely about AI that is created for singular tasks. So if you look at serial and various mapping systems that we have, or those that we use in medical services, they are all bespoke to serve in a singular situation. So single tax based AI solution. That's where we are. And that is actually significant and it has led to significant progress in health, in financial inclusion, and a lot in general development. But the next layer, which is actually where a lot of conversation is, what we call uh, artificial general intelligence, which is strong AI. Uh, this is where AI starts acting like you and I, to the extent that it can reason, it can judge, it can perceive, it can take context in, like you and I would do when we are making judgment. And that is where a lot of concerns are. Is your singularity, mm -hmm. AI being so informed that it can act. And the last layer, which is where everybody's worried about, is the super intelligence, AI that is super intelligent, where you know, it knows so much that man is longer in, no longer in control and we cannot manage it. So essentially, we've done well in the area of weak AI, which is AI for singular purpose, mm -hmm. and we want to see more applications, especially in emerging market where there are a lot of infrastructural gaps, where we can see AI being deployed to automate basic processes in health, financial inclusion, even in governance, especially where resources are limited uh, and where capacity is also constrained. So those are some of the amazing stuff that we have seen. And, and to be very frank, we've seen a lot of startups emerging, particularly from Africa, who are building on this momentum to build what we call AI-first companies, companies that rely on AI uh, being deployed on basic services to automate how services are delivered. And of course, the core functionality is also AI-based, whether financial inclusion, mm -hmm. health, e-commerce, education delivery, and even agriculture as well. So explore that for us a bit, Dr. Bio, on, on exactly how much um, of the benefit of these technologies are being realized in Africa. What are the potential applications of AI in Africa? What is Africa's involvement here? Uh, there was a report published by PwC um, about two years ago around the overall value that AI is going to contribute to the global uh, GDP, that's gross domestic product. 
uh, and it says about $15.7 trillion will be added to the world economy. And of that, Africa has just a meager percentage, which substantiate the issues that you have mentioned around what are the use cases and what are the challenges in Africa. If there is any continent where AI has such a big socioeconomic impact, I would say it's Africa, because mm -hmm. of the massive shortage that we have, whether in manpower, in people, in skill, and infrastructure. And based on some of the early use cases we have seen, let me pick an example, health. Mm -hmm. Look at the number of health workers in Africa. Beyond the problem of brain drain is also the problem of how many doctors can we train. Right. Uh, there was something I read in one of the British uh, medical journals that says in Africa, there's about 1.55 medical workers to about 1,000 people. So how can we intervene in that regard? The only way is to package medical competence into simple AI-powered interface such that in rural communities, in villages, right. a simple interface can act like a medical doctor, you know, can act as nurses, can provide midwifery guidance. So these are possibilities. And when you come to the area of education as well, how many teachers can we raise? How many areas can we deliver learning? AI, you know, adaptive learning technology can right. be configured and bundled within the available technology, you know, services based on, you know, mobile technology and make available in the farthest remote community. Uh, and these are the possibilities for us as Africa. And even in the areas where a significant proportion of Africa is employed, agriculture, there's so much possibility right. in how AI can be embedded to improve quality, uh, productivity, farming practice, harvesting, and of course, uh, the whole seedling process as well can be enhanced. So, Mark, I mean, we are seeing a possibility here for um, Africa to catch up with the rest of the world. But is there a risk of a deepening of the digital divide, though? Because uh, hearing what the West is doing and, uh, and Asia leapfrogging these applications, while growth for Africa, as Dr. Bio has said, you know, remains slight, does it worry us that there is a digital divide here? I mean, when we talk about AI, you know, the number one question that usually comes up with people is about job losses. And that's a legitimate concern, I think, in, in some areas. But overall, I would agree um, that I'm very excited. And I think that, you know, if you look at the startup space, um, because of AI and being able to automate making software and making apps, you know, somebody with a brilliant idea, they could be in Nairobi or Johannesburg or Lagos or Sao Paulo or Shanghai, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be much easier for anybody to make digital technology. And for me, I think that could be a spark that could really, really accelerate the growth of, of Africa's startup ecosystem. And for that reason, I'm actually quite excited and, and quite bullish on what AI is gonna to bring to Africa. All right, uh, Peter, what's your thought here uh, regarding you know, the digital divide and what AI could potentially do for the continent? Yeah, I mean, I think I would um, uh, absolutely agree with with Mark and Dr. Bayer. I mean, that there are, you know, as I said right at the beginning, there there are almost kind of limitless applications for AI, um, and you know, you just have to sort of rely on the ingenuity of people. You give them a tool, and they will find a way to uh, make use of it. And I think, um, you know, what we're seeing with ChatGPT right now um, is a, it's a large language model that that is able to um, you know, interpret uh, commands and then, you know, give back something that, that reads as though it's been written by a human. Um, so if you can apply that, you know, you can see how that might be used to create content, um, uh, you know, both written content, but there are models that also do, uh, you know, create pictorial content or even video content, you know, so that the way in which um, you know, small startups can now use these models to create, you know, a vast array of, of new content that has never been seen before. Um, I think opens, you know, tremendous, tremendous opportunities for, uh, you know, startups around, around Africa. So, you know, and I think the, the agricultural model is, is really interesting. We've been doing quite a bit of, of looking at that, um, mostly in sort of the Western countries, but, you know, agriculture is, uh, is tough, right? So margins are always slim. A lot of that cost comes from uh, inputs of things like fertilizer, uh, water, um, and you know, and then the, the the fuels to to run machines that that you know manage land. But using AI, you can really kind of narrow down on the needs for those inputs. 
it does require some investment in initial machinery, but then there are, you know, there are opportunities for companies that can provide that as a service. Um, so yeah, I mean, huge opportunities with some with some risks, but I think you know the you know as new opportunities open up, it will create jobs that will. Uh, you know, potentially offset jobs that might otherwise be lost to, you know, in other parts of the economy. Right. Uh, Dr. Bio, does it worry you, though, that whole uh, issue of the content that feeds AI? Would, what would you say? Would you say this reinforces the stereotypes towards Africa? What's your thought? Yes, uh, the whole content, uh, content generation, we actually call it generative AI, the ability of AI system to take input and generate just anything. And uh, my, uh, my co-panelists have spoken broadly about ChatGPT. There's so much happening now where you can speak and it can be converted into a video. Uh, AI can generate lyrics of song, can generate movies, can write novels and all that. And that for me is the possibility that I see that quite a lot of gaps that we have in Africa to a large extent are generative AI, the AI capability to translate one thing into another can add a lot of value, especially when uh, you know, we have you know, capacity gaps within the continent. But there are, there's a lot of issues around that, and that's about the fact that AI learns from patterns. So it is garbage in, garbage out. So right. it's a function of what you feed it. And that's where the issue of bias discrimination comes in. What is AI learning from to generate the final output from? So if I want an AI to write for me a story, uh, it's going to write based on what it can pick available. So what that means for Africa is that if you want to play big in the emerging world of generative AI, then we must increase our content that is available for the learning process. And one of my uh, co-panelists spoke about the issue of fine-tuning, where you know, we also supervise our learning, where we intentionally start building African-centric content that can become an input into the entire developmental process. And I think that is one key area that I think professionals in Africa, which we at Data Science Nigeria and several other organizations are driving towards, increasing Africans' input into the methodology and the processing of, of, of the generative uh, content so that as much as possible, the outcome are reflective of who we are, our values, our context, and what should actually or will actually serve our desired interest. All right, gentlemen, on that note, uh, let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll examine whether AI can help Africa become more competitive in the global economy and what can be done to mitigate the potential risks associated with the technology. To stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now let's continue with our discussion. Still with me in Tokyo, Mark Einstein. In London, Bio, Olubayo, Adekambi, and in Newbury, Peter Richardson, a partner and research director at CounterPoint uh, Research. Uh, Mark, let me take off with you here because one question that people would like to know is about whether AI will, repl will replace jobs. How will AI impact the job market? Is there a concern here? Right. So, yes, uh, this is always the, the number one question that comes up. And, and I think it's, it's a legitimate concern and it, and it scares people. And that's very understandable. Um, and I think that, you know, we've, we've already seen what chat GPT can do. And we've already seen a lot of major media outlets announce that they're letting journalists go because they're going to start using AI generated content. So we will see job losses, especially in the short term. I think in the longer term, Though I, I, th I think one of the, the themes on this panel is that I do see AI as an enabler. Um, and, you know, for example, in the United States in the 70s and 80s, when calculators came out and they became affordable, math teachers thought that this was the end of math. And it actually wasn't. Uh, calculators enabled students to do bigger and better things, but they had to change the way that the system worked. And I think that's what we're going to have to do with, with jobs. I, I think that um, ultimately, 
AI is going to enable workers uh, on a per capita basis to do much, much more than we had ever imagined was possible. Uh, Dr. Bayer, you know this is going to be a very touchy subject for um, Africa where unemployment is already at a record high. So how massive will the impact of AI be though on, on job losses or on the job market in Africa? Uh, for, for me, I have a, a very different opinion on this. And, and my position is based on what I've seen and the evolution of AI application in Africa at this particular time, uh, uh, AI is not a replacement technology. It's an exponential or amplification technology. It enhances work and it, and it creates more work. Because the truth is that AI can only replace the work that currently exists. In Africa, there's so many works that don't exist at the moment. And that's why, like someone said, AI either will not replace any job. It's someone who has got AI that will replace any job. So what that means is that AI is complementary. And so I don't see any significant issue. Look at medical area, look at technical area or manufacturing. We still need people to be able to support the implementation, especially when you understand that AI requires a lot of contextualization and localization. You just don't leave everything to a machine to control. You still mm -hmm. need that human-centric infusion into the entire logic. And that's why there will always be somebody that will always complement machine to get things done. So for me, uh, based on current evolution in Africa and the available statistics and what we see, we actually need more AI and it's not going to take any job based on what we have seen so far. Peter, your view? Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Bayo. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. So uh, software development, um, you know, so writing software is a pretty laborious task, but using AI, you can um, accelerate that. So, you know, one programmer could you know, go from writing you know, a few tens of lines of code per day by themselves, but using AI, they may be able to uh, generate, you know, hundreds or even thousands of lines of code. And then the task then becomes one of, you know, software testing, perhaps, that the, that the human does. So, you know, you can't just rely on AI to generate perfect code, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it may be able to kind of amplify the, the work that, that one person does. Um, so you end up with, you know, a much richer, you know, output productivity goes up. Uh, you know, for for one, you know, software developer, right. um, but you may have to, in, you know, introduce new roles that would be then, you know, more rigorously testing the output of that work. So the 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 roles might change, or they might be completely new, but you know, there are likely to be you know many new jobs that are generated. You know, either as a direct result of the use of AI or as a you know, byproduct of, of the introduction of the technology. Right. So, Mark, this also brings another aspect on the use of AI, and that is about how to regulate it. Because, you know, this technology streams almost unhindered across borders. What role do you see uh, regulators having though, to play in shaping the development of, of AI? This is another huge question, and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I think that, uh, you know, I would personally like to see an AI Bill of Rights, um, something similar like the GDPR in Europe. Um, I would like to see some ground rules. I think it's very important, as I mentioned, to have um, some AI open uh, and be audited because it's very clear that uh, social media networks like uh, TikTok and Twitter and Facebook have a very huge uh, influence on public opinion, mm -hmm. but the public, it's, it's still a black box. And so I would like to see more openness um, and privacy always needs to be uh, protected and intellectual property needs to be protected. So those are the three pillars where I think governments can play a very, very important role in regulating AI technology. Dr. Bio, what ethical considerations though, do you think should be taken into account when developing AI systems? Uh, with the possibilities that comes with AI, also come needs to be cautious, to be careful, and of course to respect humanity as we have more access to data and make some, interp uh, you know, interpret, you know, predict, plan, and use data to do quite a lot of things, especially when it comes to generative AI. And for that reason, we have to make ethics to be the core of what we do. And uh, the whole issue around explainable AI is an emerging construct in the field where we're saying that AI must put people at the center. And for that reason, 
there must be an explanation. Explain the source of the data. Mm -hmm. Explain the bias in your modeling process. Explain the bias in your final outcome, you know, because we've seen cases where models were built with biases for faces, uh, for people's gender, a lot of biases have happened. And for that reason, ethics requires that AI must fulfill certain conditions. Number one, it must be fair. Right. Number two, it must be accountable. Number three, it must be interpretable. What does that mean? Interpretability means you must be able to explain all the various mathematical or statistical consideration or assumption that informed the modeling process that led to the final outcome. And the last one is responsibility, where we are very careful that the final outcome or the decision we're making from AI right. has also been checked against you know, established values and norms. It must go, not go against what makes us human. And that for me is where AI must go beyond black box. And the old theory of fairness, accountability, interpretability, responsibility must form the core of how we implement, deploy, and apply AI, especially mm -hmm. in resource-constrained contexts like Africa. So I want to get your final comments. And Mark, I will start off with you. And as you uh, make your final remarks, I also want to find out from you if you think AI is the new frontier for a tech revolution. I think AI is going to be the great equalizer of, of the generation. I, I think, as, as I mentioned, um, this is going to enable people from all over the world, as long as you're connected, which most people are now, um, and have a smartphone, the, the, the possibilities are, are endless. And, and I think overall, this is going to be very, very beneficial. But as we've also said that there are going to be some significant risks and challenges. Um, but, but overall, I'm, I'm very, very positive. Peter, your thoughts? Is AI going to be the great equalizer as you conclude the program? Uh, I think it. I think it will in some context. Yeah, and I th you know, I think there will be, um, you know, both in business and in life, there will be winners and losers. Um, so it's it's not a it's not necessarily going to be a kind of a straightforward path. Um, but I think you know we've been talking. What we've been talking about essentially is artificial narrow intelligence. So uh, using uh, AI to do you know one task really really well, and I think that's you know, the path that we're on right now, and that will continue to be the case. Artificial general intelligence, which is the scary one where, you know, AI becomes, you know, equivalent in, in intelligence and ability to learn and develop as, as humans. I think we're still very far away from that. And I think that the current paths that we're on, you know, don't lead us to AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence. So I think there is you know, huge, huge opportunities, particularly in Africa, as we've been talking about. Um, and I, you know, I'm excited to see what uh, what comes there. So, yeah, I think that the opportunities are great. There are some risks, but I think those can be managed. And I think the, the longer term kind of, you know, concern about, you know, a world takeover by a, you know, an artificial intelligence is probably you know, still a long way off if it ever happens at all. Dr. Bio, you have the final word. Why the fear of AI takeover of, or the apocalypse of AI is real, is something to be considered, but we must know that AI has come with a lot of possibilities and opportunities. But of course, uh, we must provide that balance. It's a game of risk and reward, and the reward is so huge. But within that reward is the need to be inclusive and to be representative, such that inclusion is not just uh, gender or national inclusion. Inclusion is serving every different areas of humanity. So at the end of it, AI actually improved the quality of life of everyone everywhere. And in doing that, we improve how we live, work, and play, and make the world a better place for everyone. All right, gentlemen, a very interesting discussion there. But that's what we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts. In Tokyo, Mark Einstein, Chief Analyst, Telecommunications and Digital Services. In London, Dr. Bayo Olubayo Adekanbi, founder and lead consultant, Data Science Nigeria. And in Newbury, Peter Richardson, a partner and research director at Counterpoint Research. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter, and you can watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. To join us again next week for more Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, bye-bye.